Anyway, I was like, yeah, what's up? Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's Tara, and we are coming to you live from the Corat Lawn Cantata. I am really excited to have one of our longtime supporters and fan favorites up at the core today to talk to you about latest non-operative orthopedic treatments. Dr. DeWald has been up here quite a few times and is actually my very first live stream lecture physician last year. So I'm really excited to have him back, show him some of our updates, which include being able to live stream while having guests in person at the core. So you cannot see behind us, but we actually have a small live audience here that may be asking questions and engaging with Dr. Jawald here at the core. But for those of you that are at home, a few things to maximize your experience. Please know you have a comment section, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, that you can type in those questions. We have a team member here that will get those questions to Dr. DeWall before the end of the talk and get those answered. If you happen to be having any audio or visual issues, send us a note, and if there's anything that we can do to troubleshoot those, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, again, thank you again for joining us. Do know, for those of you that want to share this content, this video will be available on the TMC YouTube channel upon completion of today's talk. So I'm going to go ahead and have Dr. DeWald come on up and take over. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hello. Thank you all for, for coming out. Thank you for everyone watching on online. Um, so we're going to talk today about the latest non-operative orthopedic treatments. I'm a sports medicine physician. I do interventional orthopedics and I do a lot of regenerative medicine as well. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about a few conditions, what are kind of the, the old standard, what um, are some of the, the surgeries that could be necessary, and then these new, these new treatments that kind of fit in between those two in certain cases. So a little bit about me. I was born here in Tucson, went over to California for for undergraduate and then St. George's University for medical school. I was in New York and then Detroit for residency um, and then Alabama for a year for a sports medicine fellowship. And then I've been back. This is going to be my fifth year coming up at Tucson Orthopedic Institute, which is just next to TMC on, on Grant. So these are just some of the, the organizations I'm involved in. Um, so this is kind of a new field, interventional orthopedics. Uh, we're dealing with microinvasive procedures, so usually um, a little a little needle, um, and these are mainly done under ultrasound guidance. So there's a, a huge advancement in the the quality and the accessibility of ultrasound. So I truly believe this is kind of the future of orthopedics. Um, we can do all these procedures in the office or not going to the operating room. There's no anesthesia. Um, so it's really kind of a, a paradigm shift, just kind of like 50 years ago when they introduced the, the knee scope or the shoulder scope to do some of these procedures. Um, and that kind of changed the, the course of orthopedic surgery. I think this is going to be the next new advancement. So the ultrasound guided procedures, you're able to see uh, the needle going in, you're able to see all the, the bones, the muscles, the nerves, everything like that. So it's, it's making it a lot safer for the patient and a lot more accurate. Um, so as far as what the previous standard was with injections and what is actually still the standard um, in a lot of practices is Feeling, feeling where you want to go and, and sticking a needle in and hoping you get it in the right spot. Um, there, there was a study amongst orthopedic surgeons for the knee, which is the biggest and um, technically the, the easiest joint to get into. And they, they did a trial where all the docs thought they got it into the knee and only 60% of them did. So you know, the 40% of the time, and this was one study, there's some that are, that are a little higher, a little lower, but if you've ever had a shot and maybe it didn't work, maybe it, it wasn't going to work, but maybe it wasn't put in the right location. So the, the ultrasound guided procedures really eliminate the guesswork as far as that goes. 
uh, like I said, safety, you know, you can see the blood vessels, you can see the nerves, the bones and the cartilage, and that's what we want to avoid when we're doing one of these injections. And then there's a lot of studies that show if you're using the guidance, instead of moving around, digging around, looking for where you want to be, it's a lot less painful for the patient as well when you're, when you're a lot more accurate. So I do these procedures all over the body, um, but you know, due to time, I'm just going to focus on the, the higher yield ones, the ones that um, are just for the upper extremity. So I'll be talking about carpal tunnel syndrome, trigger fingers, uh, calcific rotator cuff issues, frozen shoulder, and trigger points. So the, the first thing we'll talk about is carpal tunnel syndrome. So it's a, a syndrome where the nerve, so that, that yellow structure up there, gets trapped in the, in the wrist, and that can cause numbness, tingling, weakness in, in the hand. So basically it's a, a compression syndrome uh, that can cause those symptoms. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of these things today, a little more common in women than, than men. We have all women here today. But um, other things that, that can put you at a higher risk of these is if you have diabetes, any type of obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, and then repetitive, um, repetitive actions at work um, or at, at play, just doing the same thing multiple times. So usually the way we figure out if this is carpal tunnel or not is by talking to the patient, doing the physical exam, um, and with the ultrasound, you can use it for procedures, but you can also use it for diagnostic. So you can follow the nerve, and usually if it's getting pinched, before it gets pinched, it'll, it'll be a little bigger, a little swollen. So you can see that on ultrasound, um, but the standard is what we call a nerve conduction test or an EMG, where a doctor will put sensors on you and see if that nerve is getting pinched at the elbow, at the wrist, or, or at the neck. So that's, that's kind of the, the gold standard as far as diagnosing this. And then as far as treatment right now, um, the number one thing, a lot of times this gets worse when you're sleeping at night because your wrist can be back and forth and that puts more pressure on it. So there's a, a wrist splint or we call it a night splint uh, anti-inflammatory medications, Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen, making sure everything's set up correctly. You know, if you're typing all day that your seat's high enough, your back straight, stuff like that. So work modifications and then injection therapy um, and, and surgery. So Previously, the, the injections that we were doing for these were the, the blind injections where we know the nerve is around here somewhere and we just kind of feel it, stick, stick it in and hope, hope we get close to it. Um, and I'll show you what the, the latest advancements are. Um, but the last thing as well is surgical intervention. So if you, can, if you can see, it's kind of hard with that screen there, but if you can see that transverse carpal ligament, that's usually what they will cut to, to open up more space around the nerve. So that's the, that's the surgical procedure if all else fails. So when using the ultrasound, um, you can be a lot more accurate and, and aim the needle right underneath the nerve and right above the top of the nerve. So the procedure that I do is called a hydrodissection. So that basically means we're using water most of the time saline. Sometimes we'll have some numbing medication and, and a steroid as well. But really it's the, the large quantity of fluid that can kind of peel the nerve and give it more space so it's not being entrapped by the surrounding structures. So if you if you see up here that that, that diagonal line is the needle coming in and you see it's going right underneath the nerve. And then in the next, in the next one, it will go above the nerve as well. So it really frees it up from that surrounding tissue. And um, we're getting very good success with this 
for, for people with mild, moderate, and even severe carpal tunnel syndrome. And, you know, it's done in the office. It's a needle poke, but it's not a surgery. It's not, you don't need anesthesia or a surgical center or anything like that. So that, that is the first thing we will talk about. So the next one, is trigger finger so it it's a condition where your finger can have some pain but the main number one complaint is it it locks up on you when you're moving it back and forth it's hard to to move it back into extension um and you get kind of a, a lock or a, a catch there um so a lot of times it will get stuck in a bent position you'll have to use you know your other hand to move it back out that way um, there can be some pain and some swelling. The, the medical term is stenosine tenosynovitis. Um, and that means that each one of the, the bones has a tendon that is connected to it. And some of the tendons have a sheath around them. So that's what that uh, stenosine tenosynovitis is basically where the nerve, or sorry, where the, the tendon goes through, it's getting caught on a pulley. So it's kind of like an, uh, a bridge that it's getting caught in when it goes back and forth. Um, and unfortunately, again, this, this is more common in women more than men, uh, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, you're at an increased likelihood. And then if you're doing repeated gripping, um, sometimes with uh, climbers, they'll, they'll get it a lot when they're using their fingers but just normal daily activities can, can cause this as well. So again, we'll kind of discuss the, the diagnosis. This is mainly physical exam to, to just watch the reproduce, it being reproduced when you're moving back and forth. Uh, sometimes we will get x-rays. Sometimes there can be arthritis or other things that are going on. And we can also use the ultrasound to see uh, those tendons, it, it, where they're getting caught and at which level. So the treatment, you know, if it is repetitive gripping or repetitive uh, overuse, it's going to be rest, physical therapy, stretching, again, the anti-inflammatory medications, the injections, and then if all else fails, we'll talk about surgical intervention. Um, so again, the previous, the previous injections that were done were blind, where you know you'd feel where it hurts, inject it in, into the hand, and hope it's going into the right place. Where with the ultrasound machine, we can see the tendon, we can see where it gets, where it gets caught, and and specifically target that area, and even give give that tendon more room. To, to function correctly. So yeah, this is, this is another one of the new, the new procedures that we are doing. Up next is frozen shoulder, or we call it adhesive capsulitis. And this is mainly each joint in the body has a capsule around it that kind of holds everything together. And with frozen shoulder, sometimes there's a reason, sometimes there, there's not. You get a lot of buildup of fibrous tissue and it kind of contracts around the shoulder. And the main thing is you have decreased range of motion when you're, when you're trying to move your arm. Uh, so stiffness, pain, um, a lot of times this will come about if you break your wrist or you hurt your wrist or your elbow or your shoulder and you're in a sling for a while. So the, your shoulder stuck in that one position and our bodies do not like to be in one position, whether it's the knees, the shoulders, or whatnot. But for whatever reason, the shoulder has a tendency to freeze up and, and cause this condition. Um, again, diabetes, uh, thyroid disorders, and cardiovascular disease puts you at a little bit higher risk for this. Again, a little bit higher in women versus men, and usually over the age of 40. So... Again, with the diagnosis, it's going to be a, a physical exam. We'll, we'll usually get an x-ray just to see if there's any underlying arthritis. Um, and, you know, the gold standard to, to see this is an MRI where we can actually see that the capsule is, um, is inflamed there or there are adhesions that are, that are causing that decreased range of motion. 
So the, the first line treatment for this is definitely physical therapy. Unfortunately with this, even if you get in soon with physical therapy, these can last anywhere from six months to 18 months, even if you're doing the correct things all the time. So it takes a while for, for the, the shoulder to become unfrozen and then you need to build up the strength after that. But again, anti-inflammatory medications, the cortisone injections, and then the surgical things for this, uh, one is, is going under anesthesia and basically having the surgeon manipulate your arm to try to break up those adhesions. And then the last line is, is you know, a full surgery where they're going in um, arthroscopically with a scope to try to uh, break up the, the material as well. So, you know, the, the usual injections were the blind injections. Now we do a procedure called capsular dilation, which basically means we're trying to put a lot of fluid in there to expand that capsule to stretch it out so you can have more range of motion, less pain. We usually do it with a lot of numbing medication. Um, I even do a nerve block. There's a nerve back here that supplies the shoulder. So I'll do a nerve block first um, and then get the needle into the shoulder joint and then usually put almost 40 milliliters of fluid in there to really stretch it out. So you can see this was right, right when the needle went in is this, this picture here. And then if you see that dark area, you know, above the white, that's the bone at the bottom and that's the stretched out capsule, that dark area above it. Um, and every time we do one of these, I'll have the patient schedule a physical therapy appointment, you know, an hour or two afterwards, because we're using them in medication. So we really stretch it out and then we get them in with the physical therapist and they can get that, that range of motion back. We usually still, still need continued physical therapy after this, but this is, this is solving a lot of the problems and a lot quicker than if we were just doing physical therapy alone. All right, next up uh, again in the shoulder is calcific tendinopathy, specifically the, the rotator cuff. So this is a, a condition where there's usually some wear and tear in the tendon that is going throughout the shoulder and instead of the body regrowing, putting new material down, sometimes some calcium fills in the little defect of the tendon and that's what we see on the x-ray here. So it's not a piece of bone. It's usually pretty, pretty liquidy or kind of like toothpaste. But, but most of the time with these, that is causing pain. You know, that's causing decreased range of motion. Um, and that's why we, we like to treat these. So usually we can see these on, on an x-ray. Sometimes we'll be getting an MRI for another reason. And that will, that will show this as well. Um, so the mainstay of, of treatment, again, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, and then the injection therapy, just to try to, to calm it down. And then there is an arthroscopic surgery for this, where they can go in and kind of debride the area where the calcium is. Um, but the procedures that we are doing under ultrasound, you can, you can see, the area of calcium, get the needle in there, put a little a little water, a little saline to loosen it up, and then we can actually pull out some of the calcium. And this is kind of what it looks like. So it's a cloudy material, like I said, kind of like toothpaste. And usually patients get pretty immediate relief from this. Again, you're the calcium is coming out of a bad part of the tendon, so still recommend physical therapy afterwards to help regrow and heal that, that tendon. And then the last thing, and this is not just the upper extremity, we do it all over the body, are, are trigger points. So these, this is just kind of a diagram. They're all over the body, just certain areas where the, where the muscles have pain and sometimes spasm. So they call it myofascial pain syndrome. So you have basically skin, muscle, and in between is called the fascia. 
and that can sometimes contract and cause cause spasm, cause tightness, and also cause pain around that area of the muscle. And a lot of times, if you have a trigger point here or here, you'll, you'll feel it there, but then you'll also have a weird feeling down the arm or down the back. So that stuff, even though the problem could be here, you can have pain in other areas, um, as well as the muscle spasm. So the diagnosis of this is really the, the history from the patient and doing the physical exam and the treatment for this, uh, physical therapy. They have started doing a lot of dry needling now, uh, which is similar to the, the procedure that I do. So I'm a big fan of the dry needling. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of similar to acupuncture, but more the Western form of that. Uh, massage therapy can help, medications can help, and then the trigger point injections that, that we do in clinic. So there are some areas, um, especially on the back or the, or the chest, that are very close to the lungs. I mean, we have to worry about blood vessels, other things, but a lot of times when I'm doing these, I want to use the ultrasound because I don't want to hurt your lungs. So, so that's a, a great tool that, that we can use to avoid the, the bad structures. Um, and this is actually a, a, a very satisfying procedure because if you're getting the right place, you'll, you'll actually see the muscle spasm and you know you've got the right place and, and usually the patients are, are getting good relief from that as well. So there's hundreds of other procedures we do, you know, on the, the upper extremities, the lower extremities, using, using these new techniques, using the ultrasound machine. Um, but, you know, that, that is what we, what I put together for the upper extremity ones. But, you know, the, the, the carpal tunnel one, there's a similar one at the elbow for a different nerve, the ulnar nerve. There's a nerve down in the foot, same thing. So, you know, a lot of these concepts can apply to different areas of the body, but that, that in my opinion, is going to be the, the new standard of care once more of the, the docs like me start learning this ultrasound technique and start, and start using it in practice. All right. Well, that is, uh, that's the presentation. We have a couple questions here. Yes. What is a good anti-inflammatory that you can take that doesn't process through your kidneys? Is there any? Sure. Sorry. No, every one of the anti-inflammatories goes, you know, down your throat, in your stomach. It's not good for your stomach. And it goes through the, through the kidneys. Um, and then long term, that's not good for your heart either. Um, so most of the time when I'm prescribing or recommending, I usually say for two weeks, try to knock out the inflammation, but I don't like patients on that long term. The one thing I really do like compared to an Advil or an Aleve is turmeric. There's different doses, you know, it's not regulated by, by the FDA, um, but there are, are some very good reputable brands and that has a lot less side effects compared to the other one. I tried that. Didn't do that one? Yeah. So do the other ones work for you, but it, you're just worried well, about the um, kidneys? I, I didn't want to take it because it was going to bother my kidneys. I didn't yeah. Know kidney problems, but I was yeah. wondering if there's any uh, topical. Topical. How about like that Voltaire? Yes. I, I probably, that's the, and it's, it's actually just became over the counter, but that was the number one thing that I, that I've been prescribing for years because that avoids the throat, the stomach, the kidneys, and you can just put it on the area of need. So yeah, that, 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 that is a good one. Um, but, but really the only, the safest medication, unless you have any type of liver issues is, is acetaminophen and Tylenol helps with pain, but it is not an anti-inflammatory medication. So yeah, I mean, back to your original question, really there are not any anti-inflammatories that, that don't go through the kidneys. No, well, that doesn't help you. But, uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, these injections that you're talking about, are they different than what they did before? Because I've had several injections in my fingers and my shoulder, and they're short-lived. I mean, they just, yeah. you know, don't last. Plus, they also affect, you know, my blood sugars. So yeah. 
Yeah. So some of these, you know, um, most of the ones here, it's not really dependent on the cortisone, the, the steroid that we put in there, because it's trying to, like the shoulder, expand the shoulder joint. So the main thing is just the fluid. Same thing with, with the, uh, the trigger finger. We're really just trying to give it more room. Same thing with the, the carpal tunnel. So, you know, I, I do put a little bit of, of cortisone in some of these, but not as much as a normal shot. But really, I mean, uh, a, lot of, a lot of patients have had a shot before, say it didn't work, but then we do it under ultrasound. We know it's in the right spot. So, you know, it's, it's worth a try. Even, you know, a, a lot of the other docs at the practice that don't do the ultrasound will try it first. And if it doesn't work, then they'll send it to me and say, can, can you make sure? And if that doesn't work, then it's not going to work. But it's not that they don't work. It's just, it's just they don't last. Yeah. And that's the other thing, too. Uh, someone comes in for shoulder pain, I give them a shot. I, I usually always get them into physical therapy as well. So the, the shot is will just calm it down, but it's not really going to heal what's going on. So we usually like to calm it down and then get them in and do the exercises. You know, do for, you have physical um, there, yeah, there are some different stretches and, and, and things for that. Um, but it's not, it's not like a hundred percent where if you go to therapy, I mean, that, that could still come back and, and cause that. Um, but yeah, that, you know, with the trigger finger, yeah. I mean, if you've had that before, they're just kind of going straight down to that area. And if you miss the, the cortisone will spread out a little and, and, affect that area for a while but it, it unless you get it in the exact location it's not going to get the full effect of it Thank you. you're welcome all right any online questions this is a common question is this procedure covered by insurance yes and i give a lot of talks about stuff that's not covered by insurance every single thing i mentioned today is is covered by insurance so i mean you come to the office, sometimes we'll do it, um, you know, at your first visit. But a lot of times for the, the the ones you need therapy after or whatnot, you know, we'll plan on it, come back just for that that procedure. But, yes, everything is covered um, by insurance. I mean, co-pays and whatnot. But, but, yeah, in general, these are all covered by insurance. Do you have a card? Your yes, do we do. We on, the, on the table. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so to clarify a little bit, for the injections, are those for temporary relief or are they potential to help actually eliminate the issue? I can't, or I, I'm a little confused on if it's just a temporary holdover that can actually stop the symptoms from happening. Really. And, and we talked about a few different ones, but usually in, in combination with physical therapy, this is going to be a, a permanent thing. Um, but like the, the one with the calcium, you know, we're actually getting rid of that. So that, that is helping that. With the carpal tunnel, we're actually giving it more, more room. So um, it's, it's different than the traditional just cortisone where it just masks the symptoms for a while and then they can come back. This is actually affecting the structures that we're injecting. Yeah. So that's a, a unique part of this compared to the other ones. Yeah. This is one. there, if you showed the body where it has those trigger points, is yeah. there a chart you can look at so that if you have a pain, like in your forearm here, you know it's coming from your shoulder somewhere, how do yeah. you know which trigger point it is so that Yes. Yeah. So when getting this picture for the presentation this week, there's multiple charts that that show where the trigger point is and what area it affects. So you know, there's a trigger point here, and it, it goes down the leg. So so yeah, there there are a bunch of charts, and nothing is exact. Every everyone is is a little different, but yeah, if you just Google trigger points. And look at images. There'll there'll be a bunch that. And then we'll trace it from, from, from origin to the origin. Yeah, the yeah. So some some are just like this that just show it, but there are some that you know that will show. There's a trigger point. You're going to feel it this way. Or there's a trigger point. You're going to feel it this way. And, and so yeah, they they do have those because that's the frustrating thing is 
you know, some people will have knee pain and looks perfect, you know, feels perfect. And really they have a trigger point, you know, in their thigh or something. And we treat it up here, but it takes the pain, you know, away down there. So, yep. It's a, it's a weird referral pattern, just the way the nerves and everything are made up in our body. Um, but, but, but yeah, and, and a, a, a lot of, um, you know, massage therapists use stuff like this as well to try to loosen up the muscle here that, and that will help the pain in other areas as well. While we're on trigger points, so yeah. the guided injection you're doing there, how, how does that actually work? Or is it more like a traditional shot or injection? No, it, it, so that one, usually when I'm doing a shot, I'll go to the area I want and inject it and, you know, fill up that area. With the trigger points, it's more um, of a pattern where I'm trying to go back and forth along the way after I numb it a little bit. Um, and that, that way I'm kind of searching for the, the real dense or the, the true trigger point. And like I said, you could, when you put it in, you can feel it kind of spasm. So it, it's more, more like um, the dry needling that some of the physical therapists do. Um, but obviously it's guided with the ultrasound. So we're not hitting, you know, anything we don't want it. Yes. Two points just become inflamed temporarily because this pain doesn't last forever. I mean, it mm -hmm. goes away. So, yeah. what, how, what causes it to release? Well, that, and that's the thing is, it, I mean, you know, sometimes you can just kind of work it out. Sometimes you need to get in with a physical therapist or a massage therapist. Um, but a lot of times, if, if that those things have, have not improved, it, that's when we try, try one of the injections. Um, but yeah, it can kind of come and go. and and everything like that. This so one. how immediate is the pain reduction? For these, for the trigger points, it's, uh, it's just the way yeah. Um, and, it, and it varies what, you know, what structures, I mean, for the carpal tunnel, that numbness tingling, that takes a while to kind of come back, um, you know, to your full sensation. The trigger points are usually before you leave my office, they're, they're feeling better. That frozen shoulder, like I said, we're doing it. You're going to therapy that day and probably a few more weeks after that. So that, that one takes a little bit longer. The, the calcium lavage, that, that helps a lot right away. But again, you still have to do the exercises you know, afterwards to build it back up. If there's no more, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And yeah, and and I think they have. Yeah.